U.S. President Joe Biden is sending his special envoy for the Horn of Africa to Ethiopia. This amid an international outcry at the escalation of a war that has killed thousands and created a humanitarian crisis in one of the world's poorest regions. White House National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan has urged Ethiopia's government and the Tigray People's Liberation Front to come to the negotiating table after nine months of conflict. Sullivan says that U.S. envoy Jeffrey Faltman will be in the region for nine days, meeting with all parties in the conflict. Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed's federal troops and forces uh, from the TPLF have been battling since, the, uh, Nove since November in a war that has killed thousands of people. The war has also sparked a major refugee crisis and uh, been marked by ethnic killings, rape as a weapon of war and a humanitarian crisis. The United Nations has warned that in July that uh, more than 100,000 children in Tigray could suffer life-threatening malnutrition in the next 12 months. This week, the rebellious Tigrayan forces say that they are in talks to forge a military alliance with insurgents from Ethiopia's most populous region of Oromia. The announcement has heaped pressure on the government in Addis Ababa. The leader of the Oromo Liberation Army says that the group has opted to join forces with the TPLF, whom they had bitterly opposed during their three decades in power in Ethiopia. To help us unpack the significance of uh, U.S. government uh, move, we're now joined by a professor of international relations at the University of the Witwatersrand, Professor John Stremelo. Thanks very much indeed for joining us and uh, welcome to the program. Thank you, Peter. Good evening to you. All right. Why do you think the U.S. is acting only now? This conflict has been in play for a significant period of time. The humanitarian crisis has been there for, again, a significant period of time. The United Nations has been speaking about it, UNHCR, UNICEF. What is it about now that uh, the U.S. suddenly want to get involved? Well, Peter, you did a, a splendid job of summarizing the dire circumstances in Ethiopia and in Tigray in particular. There are only six million people in Tigray. 4.5 million of them are regarded as, as humanitarian needs and uh, assistance needs. Four million of that 4.5 are in dire need and there's 1.1 uh, million that are already displaced. So it is a horrible conflict. And uh, what I have to speculate on, I don't know the answer to your question, specifically why now, but Jeffrey Feldman, who is being sent, is a 35-year is a uh, veteran of the Foreign Service, former ambassador to Lebanon, former assistant secretary of state for the Mideast, and a UN undersecretary general for political affairs. He is so seasoned and so experienced that I have to think that the intelligence that America is getting on the conflict suggests that it may be ripe for negotiations, especially now, as you, you uh, referred to, the Aromia region is, is uh, announced that it would go into alliance with the TPLF and Tigray, and that could change the equation, I guess, but it is a horrible situation, and only two years ago, Abe Ahmed was given the Nobel Peace Prize, for goodness sakes. Do you think that uh, uh, Abiy Ahmed has miscalculated the Tigrayan uh, situation uh, because he thought that it would be just a question of going in there and in a few weeks deal with the situation, change the government, and then Ethiopia carries on? Well, you're putting your finger on what for me has been the biggest surprise, which is the ability of the Tigrayans, who of course fought a guerrilla war uh, to get rid of uh, Mengistu and the authoritarian regime there, and then ruled for 30 years and became increasingly problematic uh, before the change, that um, I underestimated their ability and resilience to retreat to the, to the countryside, reorganize, uh, get some arms, apparently from captured arms. I'm not sure how much assistance they're getting from the outside, and there's mixed reports on that. It's very, very, very hard to know what's exactly going on. But um, uh, they've, they've, they repulsed the, the Tigrayans, and 
Even more importantly, the Eritreans who were there and causing so much mayhem and raping and other allegations also were on the back foot and pulled out. So um, it was a conflict that turned a corner very quickly. But now where do you go? Because it is a humanitarian crisis and Ab Abe Ahmed is not allowing the humanitarian relief to get into the Tigray area. Now, for negotiations to take place, um, each side must go in there thinking that uh, they'll get something out of uh, these negotiations. We saw the Tigrayan forces um, parading captured Ethiopian soldiers through the streets uh, uh, in Tigray not so long ago. So it looks as if they are winning uh, this battle. So what's the incentive for them to come to the table? Shouldn't these negotiations have started long before this? Well, of course they should have, but they were not ripe enough. And, and uh, you, you, you exhibit a, a, a real sensitivity for diplomacy, Peter, because it's got to be in the interests of the two parties to think that they are going to get at the table what they wouldn't get on the battlefield. And in the case of the Tigrayans, yes, they have the initiative militarily, but their people are on the, on the verge of starving to death. So that it is a situation that is maybe ripe for some sort of a resolution. And the United States has given, been giving uh, Ethiopia over a billion dollars of foreign assistance as a, quote, strategic ally in the, uh, in the unstable uh, Horn region. And it's now, as a result of this conflict, got problems with Sudan, problems with Somalia, or problems, of course, with the Eritrea, uh, and, and, and the, the whole horn of Africa is, is, is in a terrible mess. And I just hope, hope my fingers are crossed that, that uh, uh, Jeffrey Feldman uh, uh, has a, a, a clue on how to bring the two sides together and get a, uh, a, a truce and some sort of a, a, a peace agreement. What might he be able to do? I mean, it, it could be that the United States can offer both sides something. Well, they've got money, of course, and uh, they've got a history of involvement that is uh, wearing very, very thin. And they have allies in Europe and allies uh, around that all want to have an end to this. We haven't even mentioned the, the, the Grand Renaissance Dam and the tensions that we thought was bringing up with Sudan and Egypt over that uh, behemoth that, that uh, the Ethiopian people are financing themselves and building on the Nile River. And, and that got underway back in 2020. Uh, the, the, uh, the, 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 the Tigrayan War got underway in 2020. And don't forget COVID, which allowed uh, uh, Abiy Ahmed to postpone the elections that he was supposed to stand for. And it, it is really a mess. It is totally a mess. And, and we used to have such optimism for Ethiopia and its ethnic federalism. I guess it's just a, a reminder to South Africans that uh, constitutional democracy requires uh, you not to isolate um, uh, uh, ethnic groups and homelands, but to bring everybody together and recognize the integrity of their identity, but that they have a larger loyalty to the state of Ethiopia in this case, and I think that's really fraying. It's really fraying. There's a great fear that the federal project that is Ethiopia could collapse, especially now that we're seeing uh, this conflict uh, spreading to uh, other areas, other regions. And as you mentioned, uh, the uh, Oromos also now saying that they're going to partner with a former enemy. Um, what would be the consequences of a failed Ethiopian Federation? Well, it's practically teetering on a failed state, which is fought with irony, because as I say, two years ago, Abiy Ahmed was the hero of the world as a peacemaker with the Eritreans and got the Nobel Prize, and now he's, got, he's sitting on a, on a near failed state. And it doesn't seem to me that, um, uh, it never seemed to me that the ethnic federalism made sense. Ethiopia is a very old civilization nation, I understand that, but you have to make um, these uh, various regions see the positive sum game of cooperation and not just defending their ethnic identity, and not to mention that there are, are minority groups within those, those, those uh, federated uh, 
provinces. And so um, it, it really is, uh, I hate to say it, but I, I wish they had taken the South African page out of its constitutional book rather than going the ethnic federalist route, which many people suggested was the solution to South Africa's problems. And while we have a lot of problems down here, it clearly was not. As you said uh, earlier, uh, we've got a, a guy in charge who got a Nobel Peace Prize not so long ago. Uh, but now it looks as if um, he's really at the center of uh, some of the challenges that the country is facing. Could it be that forces even within his own government on his own side of this conflict may think that the best way forward is to get Ahmed out of the way and get other people to negotiate with the Tigrayans? You put your finger on my hope, uh, and, uh, and that's all we can say at this juncture, because I just don't know what the correlation of forces are within the Ethiopian government, but I, I don't see how, I don't see how uh, Abiy Ahmed at this stage can bring about any kind of a resolution and a reintegration of Ethiopia and save the state, frankly. Mm. What can the international community do collectively beyond the U.S.? One would like to think that, you know, the head of the African Union, the, the head office of the African Union is in Ethiopia. Surely they should be leading this. Well, they should. Uh, but again, um, the, the African norms on uh, involving one's uh, collective effort in a sovereign state are still very much a work in progress. And it does seem to me that you need not only the African Union, which you certainly do need, but you also need the UN and the other major donors that have been involved in supporting the Ethiopian government to stand up in one voice and say enough is enough. Are we past the point of no return in terms of, even if they sat at the table, um, can anything ever go back to what it was before the conflict or a whole new political map has to be drawn going forward? Yeah, no, no and yes. You know, we, we are uh, at, a, at a moment when it may be ripe. I just don't know. Mm. But it, it's not going to be what it was uh, uh, before. They, situations like this never are. But it could be salvaged. Uh, so, I mean, I, I retain hope that uh, this ancient uh, civilization nation uh, that stood up so proudly against uh, fascism, remember in the 30s when the emperor was, uh, was futilely uh, uh, trying to rally the world, and uh, remind people that um, Ethiopia uh, can stand on its own effectively, but Ethiopians have to do it for themselves. I remember when uh, the crisis was at the worst stage down here, uh, uh, George Bush recommended that Jim Baker come over and mediate, and both de Klerk and Mandela said, no, thank you, we'll solve this problem for ourselves. It's got to be owned locally, Peter, we all know that, but they can be nudged in the right directions, and that's what I think this Feldman mission is about, and he's got a lot of support from other powers and the UN and maybe he'll be successful. I don't know. It is a long shot. All of these efforts are long shots. Well, there are millions of people that are depending on uh, some kind of progress. And uh, let's hope that the Feltman mission does yield some fruit. Professor, always great talking to you. Thanks so much indeed for joining us. Thank you, Peter.